fitness for 25 years, been a vegan for about 30, and I have a specialty actually in geriatrics, enhancing cognitive functioning. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do a program on how to basically make a plant-based diet work for you. Now, I love music, and I never was able to become a musician. What I love about concerts is I love seeing a group like the Rolling Stones, where they bring somebody, Mick Jagger would bring a celebrity on stage to play with them. And they play, they bring like Buddy Guy, one of the best blues artists in the world, who is better than Mick Jagger. And that's what I did today. I brought Dr. Connie Sanchez. Since we were at the Ask the Expert booth, she was there, and they said, come on and join me. You're way too kind. So, and the other reason I brought Dr. Sanchez on board is I thought, well, look, at I travel around the country. She's here. So if you're looking for a physician, you're looking for somebody to work with, she's the person to go to. So we're going to kind of do this, uh, you know, together. And also, I'd like to make this a lot of Q&A so you guys can ask specific questions, okay? But before we begin, um, how many people here are vegetarians? Any vegetarians? Any vegans? Okay, and then other people interested in it? Okay, good. Well, as I said, you know, I've been a vegan for almost 30 years. I started out in high school, and so I, I've you know, worked with a lot of people, and I've seen what works and what doesn't, and I can help you guys succeed, and I know all the, you know, pretty much everyone has asked me a million questions, and I've seen what their challenge is, whether it's dairy foods or processed foods. So we're going to try to cover that. There's a lot of pitfalls to a plant-based diet if you don't do it properly. We're seeing many vegetarians and vegans become bigger and bigger and bigger every year. Blood pressure going up, again, cardiovascular disease. So first of all, when you follow a vegetarian diet and you come into my office and you tell me you're vegetarian or vegan, honestly, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea because I go travel across the country and people tell me they're vegan and I see them eating a cheese sandwich, a real cheese sandwich. Or people tell me they're vegan and they say they eat fish once a week. So I don't really know what that definition is. So that's one of the challenges that we face. Uh, veganism can get a bad name because a lot of people do some crazy things. And generally, what we're talking about today is 100% pure plant-based diet, no animal products at all, okay? So not eating any honey at all. We're not using any uh, dairy products, not any fish, fowl, anything at all that's from an animal, okay? So one of the challenges that I've known the most that I see is they all, people always ask me, well, John, you know, when I become a vegetarian, what do I really eat, okay? And I tell people to make it very simple, eat things that grow from the ground. So fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, peas, lentils, legumes, anything that grows from the ground or from trees, okay? We're not eating any animal products. And what we don't want to eat, this is what's gonna hurt you the most, are processed foods. And unfortunately, when I started as a vegan, you know, almost 30 years ago, there wasn't processed vegan foods. So there wasn't soy milk, there was powdered soy milk. And then all of a sudden these processed foods start coming out and what happened to our diet? Well, all of us were eating a hippie diet back then in the 60s and 70s, it was fruits and vegetables, beans, peas and lentils, things that grew from the earth. Then the processed vegan foods start coming out and that's what we start eating. The problem is, is these are processed foods. They're not whole foods anymore. They've been adulterated. So they're very high in sodium. You've got all these textured vegetables, soy proteins. They're worse for you than almost anything. They're loaded with tons and tons of fat. We originally are trying to move from a, uh, a standard American diet, which most people eat today, high in fat, high in sugar, high in sodium. And then we move to the same thing in a vegan community. We eat tons of fat, tons of sodium, and tons of sugar. We can't have that. We want to eat a plant-based diet. We're eating just foods that grow from the earth. Does that make sense? You want to comment on that at all? I'm a naturopathic doctor and I practice here in um, Lakewood. And one of the things that I see all the time is people are coming in, they have, they're on a vegetarian diet, they're on a vegan diet. And when I have them do food diaries and take a look at what they're actually consuming, it's not really a plant-based diet. And that really concerns me because if we're not eating plant-based and if we're not eating whole, you know, 100% plant foods, and you're just sort of filling in with all these vegan types of, you know, transitional foods, a lot of people will call them transitional foods. If that's the majority of your diet, I see sick people. And I see a lot of sick people, and so that really does concern me. So what John's talking about here, it happens, and we all can kind of fall into that, 
especially for new vegetarians or new vegans looking for you know different ways of you know kind of maybe going for that comfort again because those are the foods that we're really used to those are the foods that are very common to us we grew up with them we're familiar with them and we kind of always kind of gravitate towards those things but what we want to try to introduce to you is something called a hundred percent you know whole food that means as close to the way Mother Nature has prepared that food as possible. And that's going to give you the most vitality, the most health, and that's what you need to gravitate toward. That's what you need to kind of, you know, put some of these other kinds of foods on the back burner and use them as treats maybe, or maybe at special occasions, and not just use them because they're so familiar and they're so tasty um, that it takes over your diet. Because otherwise you're going to have ill health. The biggest challenge that I see with my clients when they come into my office with a food diary, even the ones who are vegetarian and vegan, is they're not eating enough volume of plant matter. So I ask them how big are their salads, and they'll show me, it's, it's like this, it's the size of a teacup, and they use a half a cup of dressing on there, which is all fat and oil. So you have to eat large volumes. If this was a bowl for me, this is going to be about a size salad that I recommend for most of my clients, filled to the brim. And that's just the salad. That's not in addition to steamed vegetables that I have them use, or you know, whole grains, and maybe a little bit of nuts and seeds in there. But they, you need to up the volume, okay? Because we're never going to be really able to eat enough plant matter. It's very difficult. About, about a pound of green leafy vegetables is 120 calories. One tablespoon of vegetable oil is 120 calories, and it's 14 grams of fat. So I can eat a whole pound of green leafy vegetables, basically zero fat. 120 calories, or just one tablespoon of oil. This has nothing in it that's going to be beneficial for you. This has everything your body's missing. All the phytochemicals, phytonutrients, carotenoids, fiber, everything that we need. So my suggestion is this. If you don't have a weight issue, you're not really trying to lose weight. If you saw this morning, we talked about smoothies in my cooking class. Smoothies are a really good way for you to start your day because you're unable to take a large volume of fruits and vegetables and you're basically able to put it in a drink. So in other words, what I'll do is I will have my clients make a big smoothie, and for instance, they'll use blueberries, they'll use strawberries, but then they really load it up with greens. Kale, bok choy, chard, um, any sort of green they want. And then they're gonna put it in the blender, mix it up, maybe a little flaxseed. They're gonna drink some for breakfast, but they're gonna make an extra amount to fill in their stainless steel or glass jar. I have them put it in the freezer for about 15 or 20 minutes, let it get really cold, and then they take it with them in their car or when they're at work and they're sipping on it throughout the day. This way in the morning, they've got blueberries, mangoes, kale, whatever else they wanted to put in there. They never eat that at breakfast. So by using a tool like a blender or a Vitamix, you're able to bring a lot of nutrients into your liquid. Does that make sense? No, I agree. Um you know, we need to have a salad that is the shock and awe salad. And I really think that, you know, we think about these little dinner salads. That is just not enough great, you know, nutrition. And so what John's talking about is using something like a smoothie and adding different kinds of greens to that. How many of you guys do that? It's so simple, isn't it? You know, you can do kale, you can do spinach, you can do some more of the bitter greens, dandelion, if you're really, really... You know, they're potent, but they're very, very healing to the liver. And these are the kinds of things that you need to start incorporating into your diet because this really is the magic here, right? And so it's the green leafy foods that we all need to start incorporating into our diets more and more and more. Yeah, you know, being in, in geriatrics for 20 years, we see the rate of Alzheimer's and all these diseases rising and rising and rising and rising. I've never seen any senior in the retirement home any sort of volume of plant matter. Uh, their salad is less than a teacup. It's basically just a piece of lettuce on their burger. And again, you know, it, it's oxidation occurring throughout the body and aging and this free radical formation. It's not the animal products that are protecting them. It's creating the problem. It's the phytochemicals that are in the plants, the lycopene that's in the tomato or the grapefruit or the watermelon, the lutein that's in the kale, right? It's the vitamin E that's in the avocado. Those are the things that people need to get in. And you need to start when you're young. You can't start when you're 70 or 80. That's better than nothing. But we need to start now. The sooner the better. Because you're being bombarded 24 hours a day with free radicals. 
So you're basically aging continually, getting hit, 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 hit. If you don't have anything to protect you, you're in a, in a lot of trouble. So the smoothie works great in the morning. My clients who have been 320, 40, 50 pounds have lost 150 pounds in a year. No problem, they get off handfuls of medications. Many times I don't have them do smoothies, but I have them eat salads for breakfast. Why wouldn't I have them do smoothies? Any idea? It's not enough to fill you up because you've blended it, so you've right, you've blended everything down, and your brain doesn't get the signal when you're drinking it, especially if you're drinking it fast. And there's a lot of sugar in the fruit. So if I do have them do uh, a smoothie in the morning, which is once in a while, it's mainly a green smoothie, but I prefer that they're eating their salad because it's gonna take longer, the brain gets a signal, hey, I'm getting full, and then they're satisfied. Remember, one of the things that creates your feeling of fullness is fiber and water, and that creates bulk. And there's stretch receptors in your stomach that they start getting pushed, pushed, pushed. Oh, I'm getting full. There's nutrient receptors in the stomach. They start sensing nutrients. Oh, I'm getting nourished. So don't be afraid to have a salad for breakfast. There's nothing wrong with it. In Chicago, all the time, I would have a salad this size, okay, when it's winter. And then I would take uh, a bowl of steamed vegetables this size and mix them in, turn them like that, and that would be what I could have for breakfast. No problem at all. That makes sense? So salads are fine in breakfast. Uh, smoothies are great in breakfast. Anything else you want to mention for like a breakfast? I think you can. You know, okay. yeah, we, I think smoothies are one of the best ways of, of getting nutrients into our bodies. You know, this is something that I, I thrive on. Yeah. Yeah. Salads, yeah. Don't be afraid to eat something like a salad for breakfast because we, we get set into these patterns. We don't need, you know, we need to break these. So juicing, we've got a couple over here who um, have actually been on the juice fast for quite a long time. So many one days is it now? 59? 79 days. And these folks, when I first met them, yeah, big changes, big changes. So this is this is fascinating. So they do juicing in the morning, and that's another way of getting nutrients into the diet. The only thing about juicing is you're not getting fiber, but what you're really doing is because you're taking that fiber out. You're, you're going to be able to pack so many more nutrients in, into your body. Fiber kind of prevents you from doing that, but you also want to chew, you want to eat, you want to send those signals to the brain too. The challenge in, in our movement today in the vegan and vegetarian community is all the processed food. These manufacturers are not your friend. Just because they're creating a vegan food, it doesn't mean it's friendly to you. So when you're having your vegan pork sausage and the vegan scrambled eggs and the you know vegan cream cheese, there has no benefits in there at all. Anything, if anything, those things are just causing premature aging. We're seeing people getting older and older and older. They may look 70, but inside they're only 50. They're oxidizing, they're aging, they're rusting, and it's happening all the time. The seniors that I've worked with, especially when I first started in geriatrics 20 years ago, I mean, these were robust seniors. They looked phenomenal. I'd have people in my classes that were 100 years of age, but we're seeing it slowly, slowly decline because more and more processed foods in, in the diet. Same thing with the vegan community. So use those foods as transition foods. So if I work with military and law enforcement people, I don't give them sprout sandwiches at first. You know, I switch from their regular hamburgers and hot dog to a vegan burger, a vegan hot dog, uh, let them chop up the vegetarian hot dog and put it in chili. Give them some, some comfort, let them get familiar with fiber in their diet a little bit at a time, and then slowly I start weaning them away. Traditionally, for me, with my clients, I try to get them to get to the about 65-70% raw diet. So they're eating quite a bit of raw, but I don't do that all, all at once because their intestinal tract can never handle it. They have all sorts of intestinal problems and gas and everything. So move away from these processed foods. I know they're advertised in all the magazines. You see them everywhere we go, but they're definitely not your friends. Okay? Anything else on that? One of the things that I really, really stress with my clients, especially the ones who are really, really heavy, is we have to prepare. So what I have my clients do is I have them get uh, all their different containers out. So these are Happy Tiffins and they're stainless steel. You can use any type you want. And basically what I have them do is set six or seven of them out, and then they're going to make their food for the week. So they're, they're cooking their brown rice, they're making their quinoa, their amaranth, they're making their beans. They're shredding up lettuce and shredding carrots, and they're making all that. And then in each container, they're going to put a different meal. 
So one of them's gonna get brown rice, one's getting wild rice, one's getting quinoa, one's getting kidney beans, one's getting chopped tofu, whatever. So they're making seven different meals. They're gonna have a vegetable, they'll have a grain, a protein, and then they're gonna freeze them. And so this way when you come home from work, if you've had a hard day, has anyone ever come home from work and just ate cereal? You ever had that? Sure, it's easy, it's quick. But if you have this, you can basically make it in an instant. If you use a microwave, you can microwave it. If not, you can put it on the stove, it'll bake very quickly. So you have to think, you have to prepare ahead of time. It's very, very critical. So the containers are critical. And I also like the idea of doing uh, sort of a, a, a salad bar and refrigerator. You know, this is something um, I interned at True North Health Center uh, last year in Santa Rosa, California, and it's a water fasting facility. And what they'll do is they'll have folks come in and do water fast for a period of time. And it's really quite unique. And Basically, what they had was a buffet, and that buffet would be every kind of, you know, vegetable, salad, these kinds of things. And I thought, wouldn't this be really nice, wouldn't this be really great, just to have this sort of buffet in your refrigerator so that you could just, you know, go in and grab these certain foods. And I decided, you know, to have my clients go ahead and use something very similar to what John's talking about, and just putting it, you know, the greens, the sprouts, all the different kinds of vegetables, you know, when you get home from the grocery store, just go ahead and wash those things up. And if you feel like you need to chop things ahead, get things ready for you, for yourself, go ahead and get them. You know, put it, put them into containers, and then stack them in the refrigerator and label them. Let you, you know, so that you know exactly what you're getting. But it makes it so easy because when I come home, John, when I come home and I'm tired and I just don't know what to eat, I just open up my refrigerator and there's this beautiful salad bar in there, and I just start grabbing all kinds of things, and it's really nice. So cutting up vegetables is another one that I have to do. Cut up all sorts of different vegetables, mushrooms, cucumbers, red peppers, green peppers, and then doing some shredding. So shredding carrots and cabbage. Remember, if you're trying to lose weight, shredded cabbage is one of the best fillers that you can add. So I have my clients put it in their soups. I have it put in their salads. I add it to the brown rice. It's so few calories, and it fills you up just wonderful. Most of my clients say, John, I can't believe that I'm losing all this weight, and I'm so full because they're eating vegetable matter. Again, about 120 calories a pound or so, okay? So pre-making pre, pre everything is critical, okay? The other thing that's important is you really need to purge your home of foods or things that go like this to you. They tempt you, right? If you're an alcoholic, you don't keep alcohol in your house, do you? That wouldn't be a good idea because when you're weak, you're stressed, you're happy, you wanna celebrate, whatever, you're gonna reach for your drug of choice. And it's the same thing with the foods. They're really not foods that you have an addiction to, they're chemicals, okay? So the food manufacturers, they know the right formula of sodium and sugar and fats to call your taste buds. And they make it taste really alluring to you, it affects the dopamine level in your brain, and then you're drawn to it, you're an addict, okay? So you have to get rid of those foods in your refrigerator. Yeah, it's about creating an environment so that you're <coughs> successful, because I'm telling you, you go out there, you know what the environment's like, right? It's not conducive for success, and so you, you, we we have certain control over certain areas, you know, in our lives, and so our homes would be one of those primary areas. So you know, take control of that because you are in control there, and you don't want to bring those kinds of foods items items into your house because they will, you know, they will call your name and you will eat them. When I work with I work with a lot of people that have drug addictions and alcoholism. And believe it or not, I make it as difficult as I can for them to be lured in. So for some people, I actually say, what I want you to do is I don't want you to have a credit card when you go to work and I don't want you to have any money. Because this way I know their pattern, they go right to a bar afterwards and now they can't. The other thing is I have them immediately go from their work, they go to meet a friend to walk. So you have to kind of psychologically put these little roadblocks in that don't allow you to get this momentum toward down, downward spiral. We want to start creating an upward spiral, okay? Because food is the most addictive substance on earth. It's more addictive than any drug or sex or stealing or any other sort of high because you're addicted when you're an infant and then you're addicted to the rest of your life and you're addicted as a senior. So it's always going to be calling your name. But remember how many people in this room are addicted to broccoli. Now, you're not addicted to foods that grow from the earth. There's nobody in this room that's addicted to these sprouts. You're addicted to processed foods, which are really drugs. And that's why we need to change those names, okay? Because it's a drug you're addicted to. 
So when you, you plan everything, you start preparing meals. What I do is since I leave at 5.30 or so in the morning, and basically I bring all sorts of stuff with me, even if I don't think I'm gonna use it. <clears throat> so I might pack an organic coconut water in addition to my other smoothies and waters. I'd bring some dried fruits with me. I bring some nuts, some Brazil nuts or any nut you want. And sometimes I'll bring a protein. Because a lot of times for me, you know, I'm working with clients one on one, I might get a call as I was gonna go eat lunch and somebody says, hey, can you see me now? So I might just have to take that protein, mix it in some water that I have already and drink it. That's all I can have for right now. So you have to start thinking about pre-planning and bringing foods with you. And a lot of times, look, I bring a lot of food with me and at the end of the night, I take it out of my cooler and it's still full. I didn't use it all. But at least I won't succumb to a weakness by having to go to a vending machine or wherever you are, something that you shouldn't be eating. The other thing you want to do is look at your, your planner for the week. I always have my clients look every Sunday at their planner and look at the week, what's occurring. Oh, there's soccer practice and it's a party today. Oh, that means there's going to be snacks for the kids. Am I going to be tempted to eat it? Oh, I have to go out with the, the boss for dinner. Oh, are we going to a vegan restaurant? Oh, well, I didn't think about that. Maybe I should call ahead. Does that make sense? You're trying to really prepare to give you the edge, to give you the advantage. Because if you're new to vegetarianism or veganism or eating healthy, you're still being pulled in the direction that you're used to, right? It's a challenge for you. It always comes back down to that environment, and so that's something that you have to be for yourself, and it's all about learning. There's a learning curve to it. You know, how many of you walk out, you know, and, and could create this, you know, the next day? Not very many people can. And so what we're trying to do here is give you some tools for success. So you walk out here with some ideas about, you know, how you can be successful throughout your day, your working day, because, again, people are going to question you, what you're doing, why you're doing things, and, you know, I think it's really important to understand why you're doing something, but you also want to, you want to be prepared. And I think preparation, organization around your, your food choices is really going to help you to be successful. So many people say they fail, and when they fail, sometimes they fall hard. You know, how many times have people, have, you know, just given up? And we don't want you to do that. We want you to be extremely successful in your planning so that you can optimize your health, optimize your nutrition, because this is what it's really about. A lot of my clients originally, when, when I start working with them, they go toward a plant-based diet. The biggest challenge ends up being their family. I've had some people that were doing better than I could ever imagine within a month with me. And I said to them, you know, I'm really concerned about your wife. I really think she's going to sabotage your program because she's obese and she's seeing you lose weight and she doesn't want to go toward a plant-based diet and guess what happens? The wife sabotages the program. So you have to be prepared for well-meaning relatives that say, come on, you can have one piece. I mean, what's one little slab of butter going to hurt? It's you know? your birthday. Yeah, it's your birthday, it's time to celebrate. You can have it once. But remember, what you're craving or what you're having is a drug. You're not having a bowl of sprouts. So as soon as you get that high again, what do you think is going to call calling next day? So if that ever happens and you go off your program, what I do with my clients is I have them immediately, if they ever went off their program and they had too much fat, too much sugar, they had animal products, absolutely the next day, 100%, I have them do just a fruit vegetable day. That's all they have the whole day. Because we're trying to interrupt that momentum that they started to create, okay? So that's really critical, is you want to interrupt that momentum for them, okay? The other thing is, remember this saying, my doctor said. So when people say to you, well, why are you going on this plant-based diet? My doctor said. Nobody's going to argue with that, right? That shuts people up quick. But you don't want to also have to defend yourself for, your, for the rest of your life about why you eat a certain way, because it's going to become draining to you. You're going to feel like you're getting hit all the time with all these people, okay? So it's very important for you to maybe have a few little words of little things that you could say my doctor said or my cholesterol is high, but have a little comeback. There's a great book. It's called The Pleasure Trap. I would recommend it. It's at my booth. Copy of that. I have one copy left. One copy left. That'll help you with this. The Pleasure Trap. Yeah, it's really good. Alan Goldhammer and Dr. Doug uh, Lyle. The other thing I have my clients do that I think that has added the most to their success is I have every single client keep a food journal for me. 
Now, a food journal is probably the most important thing you can do because, number one, it makes you accountable for what you're putting in your body. I've had many clients say to me, John, I went to a party last night and I was reaching for a handful of M&Ms, but I realized they have to write in the food diary. I didn't have one. So it's just, but that's all we needed. That little interruption right there, that prevented them from the downward spiral. So it's these little things that you have to instill in your life. But the food journal allows me, when they come to see me, it allows me to see patterns and habits. They say they're gaining weight, and I can look and see why they're gaining weight. They're saying they're having allergic reactions. I can see why they're having allergic reactions. But the main reason I like the food journal is because it makes you hyper-conscious. It makes you start focusing on what you're doing. Most people are completely mindless eaters. I mean, I've watched people eat, and they don't even know they're eating. They're just pounding in the food. They're just eating handfuls of nut after nut after nut after nut, and I don't realize it. They're not mindful of their eating. And if you, if you take a look at the DVDs that, that we just produced, Chef Marina and I, one of the things we don't do is we don't chop foods really fast and make this stuff really quick. We want it very slow because most of the people that I work with are living such a fast-paced lifestyle. When they come home, I want to interrupt that pattern. I want them chopping slow, slow things down. Not fast food, slow food. That's your meditation. That's your time to relax and connect to your food. It's very critical because most people have no connection to their food at all. It's just horrific. I mean, especially children. Children, I'm not kidding, think that hamburgers grow from the ground. They don't have any connection where that comes from. So it's mind-boggling. So keep a food journal. It can be as simple as just writing it down. You can get a, you know, your own journal. I actually have one that will hopefully come out soon where it asks you certain questions and things to make you more conscious. But you know, you'll be able to see that on my website, which is just johnpierre.com. Uh, but the food journal is critical. The other thing is, make sure you do something every day to keep inspired and motivated, okay? So what I do is I generally have my clients uh, go on at least to five or six different web pages. So they check it out every week to look at new recipes. They like to read success stories. So like after this um, conference, I go to Vegetarian Summerfest, and I'm bringing five of my clients. You know, one girl got off nine medications, lost 150 pounds. You know, another girl had two strokes and her blood sugar was 1,000, and then we got it down to 100 blood sugar. You know, so these are success stories. People need to hear that. You need to be motivated by these stories because it inspires you. It draws you toward eating this way. Make sure you get some index cards and always write down your favorite recipes. So you keep them in a little container. They're always in your kitchen. You could just kind of play, just pick one and say, oh, that's what I'll make today. You have to have that ammunition for you to help you be successful. If you subscribe to magazines, which I don't have a problem with, if what I like to do is get five or six clients to subscribe to a different magazine and then share them because that motivates them. But the other thing you may want to think about doing is if you get a magazine and they're giving away a bunch of free ones here, after you're done reading them, cut out different pictures or words that inspire you and create a collage. So with my clients, when I go into their basement to work out with them, they have a collage right on their wall that they see as we're working out. So they're always looking at the inspirational words, and they can change the collage. You don't have to keep the same collage. They can just change it all the time. As a matter of fact, about every month, when their goals are starting to change, they're changing their collage. That makes sense? I think those are all fantastic ideas, and I, I totally concur with all of that. Um, I just want to tell a small little story because I think it's really interesting and it really changed my approach in working with people. And it was my experience when I did do an internship with True North um, Health Center out in Santa Rosa with Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Clapper, and um, Doug Lyle. And what I saw was those folks when they came in, many of them very sick, many of them with autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease, cancers. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, things like obesity, people just wanting a health holiday, something, you know, to change or break their patterns. And folks would come on in and they, they literally would be put on water fasting, water only. So these folks, obviously it was medically supervised, but basically what we were doing is we were taking all food away from them. All food. And I have folks that were fasting anywhere from a week all the way up to, let's say, 30, 40 days. And you know, how many of you have ever went on a water fast? 
you know how difficult sometimes that feels. But after about three days, you start to lose your appetite, and it gets a little bit easier as time goes on because you're changing the fuel and you're actually, you know, consuming your own body basically. And so what you're doing is you're consuming the fats. And what would happen during this whole experience was people would not feel hungry and they were being educated. They were always being immersed. And I think this is really important important when we talk about immersion programs and these kinds of things because sometimes it's really important to get away from your environment and to be totally immersed in these concepts and thoughts and ideas. And I think one of the ways that you can do that for yourself is get DVDs, you know, learn about this stuff. Who are these, you know, vegan pioneers in your community? Who are these vegan, you know, doctors that are nationally known, worldwide known? And really start to educate yourself and just really put yourself into that because in order to be successful, you have to be thinking about this. You really have to be motivated. You know, you can walk out of here being motivated today, but a week from now, what happens? You know, you can be inspired today, but what happens a week from now is really what's going to be really important. Getting back to the story, these folks, you know, fast 30, 40 days, and then we put them back on a plant-based vegan diet. And what is truly remarkable is that most of these folks, I would say about 95% of these folks, if they truly stuck with that plant-based, whole food, vegan diet, they didn't get sick again. And that profoundly changed the way I thought about a lot of things. And so when people come to my office now, this is something that I really encourage. And something like, you know, well, how do I do this? How do I make it simple for myself? Because, you know, you can have all these elaborate recipes, like I did the raw vegan pizza run, but basically, we need to simplify this and we need to make it practical so that people are successful because you can't go to True North, most of you, and check yourselves in, you know, for a holiday there. It's all, it's, it's basically a prison. <laughs> but basically, it's almost like people have to be put away in order to change their habits and to be broken of those habits. And so, again, what we want to try to, you know, encourage you to do is just learn about this stuff, immerse yourself in these things, use, utilize all these wonderful people that we have here, is create support groups, you know, talk to each other, because this is, this is the community here, and these are your support, and this is where the healing happens, and that's what's so important. So let's pay attention to what John's going to teach us here, because I'm, I really want to know, too. You know, it's all, most of the clients that I've worked with that have been clinically obese, 99% of the time, it's always an emotional issue. So it's very important that you have a structural support system, whether you go to psychotherapy or have clients see me, or you just have a group that you go to. You know, whatever type of support group it is. And if you can't do any of those, that's why it's important to have a lot of online kind of support groups, some of these nutritional things, they're online. But you want to make sure that you don't feel isolated, that you don't feel alone, that you don't feel like you're the only one. That's one of the reasons that as an animal rights activist, I go to animal rights conferences. Because sometimes I start thinking, gosh, am I the only one who's thinking about this? And then I go to an animal rights co uh, conference and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's my brothers and sisters. There's everyone who thinks like me. And it's very inspiring. You need to continually be inspired and motivated, or else it's very easy to start slowly, to slowly start taking this downward spiral. So you want to make sure you have that support group. What I do with my clients is a little bit different, I think, than most people, is that I have my clients text me almost every day, or email me every day, or call me every day. So they'll call in and check in. And then I also, as a little inspiration, I find clients. So if they don't do what I want them to do, they owe me ten dollars, and so if they don't, I'll make an agreement with them. And I need you to text me every day. And after three or four days, I'll get a call. John, I owe you thirty dollars. So it's a little bit of inspiration. But what I'm really doing is I'm I'm just really trying to make them hyper conscious to start getting starting to think about some of the things they do. So remember to keep that in mind. And the other thing that's critical: look, everyone thinks I teach nutrition and fitness. I guess so, it's what I do, it's what I'm trained in. But what I'm really teaching people is to be compassionate and loving. And that has to start within. You can't just be kind to your husband or your wife or your kids and then hate yourself. I work with a lot of women that are self-abusers. They're cutters and they're pickers and they hurt themselves. 
You know, and we need to start realizing that it's okay to make mistakes. This is about a balanced approach. You don't have to be an extremist. If you had some little extra fat one day or a little extra sugar, or you ate an animal product, you don't beat yourself up about it. It's good, better, and best. It's all stages of life that we're going through. So if your child spilled the orange juice when they're two years old, you wouldn't, you wouldn't scream at them, big deal. Clean the orange juice up, that's okay. So don't beat yourself up. Be kind to yourself, be loving. That's very important. That's what this is really about. And so many people, especially women, you know, they, they will come in and they'll break down crying to me. And uh, it's because we don't love ourselves. We don't have compassion for ourselves. And how can we, how can we extend that out to our community if we can't even do that for ourselves? So that's the beginning. And so one of the best ways that you can love yourself is by you know, providing yourself with this whole plant food-based diet. I think this is one of the best things people can do for themselves. And really, love yourself. And the other thing is, remember, everyone thinks that what we're about is a diet. The vegan diet, the raw food diet. It's really the vegan lifestyle. In the lifestyle, the diet is a small portion of it. I don't really even like talking about diet that much, because it's, it's important. But I'm more concerned about, like I had somebody the other day text me, and they said they squatted 190 pounds for five reps. And I text them right back. I go, but did you pick up any garbage that was on the ground today? Did you say any nice, kind words to somebody who needed them? There's more to life than your diet. I mean, come on. What have you done for humanity today? How have you been kind to a senior citizen? Or what have you done for an animal? Did you volunteer at a shelter? Did you donate some money? You know, the diet? You think when, when, when after 20 years of working in geriatrics, with all these seniors, do you think seniors are on their deathbed talking about how much money that they should have earned in their life? They're talking about how they wish they would have written their brother and asked for forgiveness, saying, I'm sorry I never called you. Or saying, hey, I should have donated more of my money. I should have helped other people. It's such a minuscule thing, this diet, so don't become obsessed with it. Just eat foods that grow from the ground, fruits and vegetables, beans, peas, lentils, nuts and seeds. Don't obsess about it. Throw in something that you like once in a while, a little extra thing. You know, be happy about it, but make sure that you know you're thinking about other aspects of life other than just your diet. Doug Graham, um, he said something that I really enjoyed, um, and he he wrote the 80-10-10 diet. If you're not familiar with Doug Graham, but something that he talked about was, you know, we have to. We're only going to be as healthy as our weakest link, and so if you think of a chain being made up of all these different links. Diet is just one of those links. And so what John is alluding to here is, you know, there's so much more that creates who we are. It's not just the diet. I used to be the nutrition director for Vitamin Cottage, and people would just focus on nutrition, 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 and they were taking supplements, 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 thinking this was gonna create health. And these are some of the sickest people I've ever seen in my entire life. But it's this chain, you know, and each one of us, it's going to be a little bit different, you know, where we need to focus. And some of us are going to have to focus on that compassion, service, that type of um, um, basic, you know, way of living. Other of us, you know, we're very successful with doing that, but maybe we're not paying attention to ourselves. And we're not giving that same kind of compassion and love to uh, our own bodies, our own, you know, our own healing. So think about that, you know, as every single aspect in your life, it's really just this link in this chain, and you're only going to be as strong, as healthy, as that weakest link. So let's take some, some questions from you guys, because I know that um, it's getting close to 6.30, you probably want to do some more shopping. So is there any particular questions you have or any challenges? Oh, okay, what salad dressings? Well, traditionally, I encourage most people to have some sort of fat in their salad because the fat allows you to absorb carotenoids. So I don't recommend just like lemon juice or balsamic vinegar. Sometimes I'll have clients do it, but most of the time some sort of fat. So a lot of times it's going to be avocado. A lot of times it's hummus as a salad dressing. So you can either put hummus on directly or you could take a couple of tablespoons of hummus and put it in a glass with a little water or almond milk or carrot juice and whip it up and then it'll pour on beautiful as a salad dressing. Yeah, you can add, use nuts, seeds. It doesn't have to be just avocados or something like that. Everybody loves avocados, but 
you know, a few cashews or something like that and have a little acid with that, maybe some lemon juice, and mix that in a blender, and you've got a delicious, delicious salad dressing. So there's ways of getting these whole fats into your diet without having to use oils. Yeah, I never recommend any oil at all, for at all. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's no different than sugar. It's a processed, refined product, and it's just pure fat. And remember, it doesn't matter if it's animal fat or olive oil. It starts coating the red blood cells, and they start sticking together, clumping and sludging. And that causes basically a traffic jam. And the little hemoglobin that carries oxygen can't really get through very quickly. You become fatigued. And when you fatigue, what do you want to do is you want to stimulant. And for a lot of people, it's I'm going to eat more, or I'm going to take caffeine, or I'm going to take some sort of stimulant. Chocolate. Yeah. So, it's, so you have to be very careful about that. And you know, we run this fatty circus through the most standard American diet 24 hours a day. Fatty meal for breakfast, right? And then that fat is going into the bloodstream six, seven, eight hours. And before you know it, it's already lunchtime. And then you put another fatty circus in, and it's running. You still haven't cleaned out the fat from breakfast. And then by the time it's dinner, the fat's barely cleaned out from lunch. And then you have to have a bowl of ice cream before you go to bed. So it's this whole fatty circus going on all the time. So for salad dressings, I recommend that. I don't recommend, on a regular basis, eating nuts. But as Dr. Kanye said, definitely I recommend using them in salads. Oh, if you go to my website, I don't sell them, but the link is on there. The link, they're called Happy Tiffins. I really like them a lot. Anybody else? Way in the back. Um, I really missed it, but did you, you don't like nuts a lot, and you don't like the processed oil, but what about oils on hormones and protein? Uh, oils what? We need cholesterol to make hormones too, and so cholesterol is not the enemy. Our livers make cholesterol, we need cholesterol. And one of the things about hormones is that we make all the cholesterol that our bodies need in order to be healthy. As long as you're eating a healthy plant-based diet and you're getting certain fats in the diet, there's, only, there's a couple of essential fatty acids. There's the omega-3 fatty acids and the omega-6. These are essential because you gotta get them from your diet. All the other fats our body can make, so we have no trouble making fats in order to make hormones. And, rem and remember, people, primitive people didn't have oil. I mean, they, they ate foods, but they didn't, they didn't have the machinery to create a Pringles chip or to create a candy cane. So where were they getting all their nutrients from? They're getting their, their fats from a few nuts and seeds, but remember, nuts and seeds you know, they didn't just grow by, you know, the acre and acre and acre. They're hard to find. Animals were eating them. Did they get it from meat? Get it what? Yeah, from what? Meat. Meat? Oh, did they get fat from meat? Well, the fats. Oh, they got fats from meat, sure, and plants. Yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't mean you have to get uh, fats from meat. No. Plus, remember that animal products are bioaccumulators. So when you're taking 16 pounds of contaminated grain, and you're feeding it to a cow and it's producing one pound of beef, that one pound burger you have got a lot of antibiotics and hormones and pesticides in it. It's a bioaccumulator. With fruits and vegetables, some pesticides can be washed out, and they're also high in fiber, so they chelate or grab onto and get out of the heavy metals. So animal products are the worst in terms of, of, of getting fats. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, of juicing. Uh, well, there's. Uh, I was talking about bl I, uh, blending. I mean, I recommend blending. Oh, blending versus juicing. Yeah. Yeah. So blending is a little bit better, but in some cases, like seniors who are debilitated, uh, if you do green juices for them, their body doesn't really have to process any of that fiber then, and they get absorbed right away. So it's very ther therapeutic for them. And also people with chronic illness and sometimes, you know, people with digestive function problems and so this is a way of getting super nutrients into them very, very quickly. So I think it's a good thing, but you, you don't want to be, do, you know, just relying on that. You got to chew your food, you got to get the fiber, I think, you know, with the uh, basically blended salads or smoothies and those kinds of things. That's what you're doing because you're, you're, you're retaining all of that. Um, and also make sure that you're incorporate whole food, not just, you know, these smoothies and these kinds of things, because, again, if you're not exercising that, those muscles and chewing foods, and you're not going to get the same signaling up to the brain that you're satiated.
And so I think that's a really important function. What's the story with soy protein powder? <laughs> well, it's a super isolated, concentrated form of protein. And one of the interesting things that um, I've learned in my research, and it was from T. Kwan Campbell who wrote the China study, and he was looking at, well, I'm sorry, I think I'm making a mistake. I'm, I'm thinking of Dr. John McDougall. And so what he was looking at, he was looking at soy you know, versus casein that is found in milk, which is the milk protein, and how it elevates insulin-like growth factor one. And what he, Dr. McDougall found was that it actually, I think he found some research that said the, soy, the isolated soy protein powders actually raise insulin-like growth factor one even higher than the casein proteins that were found in, in the dairy products. And the reason, if you uh, listen to Dr. Greger's uh, talk, he was talking about, you know, this insulin-like growth factor one actually is a growth promoter, and it's found in dairy products. And so again, why, you know, why do we need these growth promoters in dairy products? It's to grow, you know, small little animals into big, large animals. And basically, when you're an adult, you don't need this stuff. So what happens is that if you're taking these isolated, concentrated proteins, it's, it's you're taking it out of the way nature actually has uh, created that. And when you're taking it in that form, it's so concentrated that it can cause problems like increasing the um, insulin like growth factor cancers and, and those kinds of things. So I don't recommend isolated soy proteins. They also are generally genetically modified. They're not organic. So that's an issue. And then, of course, they often use hexane, a very caustic chemical, to extract them. But you can look at the Asian culture, they've been eating whole soy for thousands of years and they've done pretty well. So tempeh, misu, edanami, but in small amounts. They weren't eating like the vegan community is. They're eating soy sausage in the morning, tofu scrambler, then they're having soy milk, then a snack soy ice cream. Everything soy, soy, soy. That's where we run into the problems. And a lot of times the researchers don't tell you when they, when they tell you the negative effects of soy. They weren't feeding edanami or whole soybeans to their participants. It was isolated soy protein because it's cheaper for them to get it. Okay, someone else who's here had a question? Yes. Did. What, um, what do you think about eating plant foods that have estrogen? If you had um, estrogen sensitivity, what's the answer? That's a good question. Yeah, the question is, what's, what are the thoughts about eating foods that contain basically phytoestrogens, plant estrogens, and somebody who has a, uh, estrogen sensitive cancer or something like that? Well, it's really interesting because what the research is actually showing is that it can be protected. And let me explain a little reason why. Um, when you think about phytoestrogens or phytochemicals, um, they're actually produced by that plant, and they are hormones that are produced in the plant, but these are very, very weak estrogen-like compounds. They're not estrogen per se. And what's really interesting about this, it's found not just in soy, but it's found in other kinds of legumes and beans. And so people always pick on the soy bean, poor little soy, but it's found in other foods as well. And it's a very weak compound. And this is a good thing. Because when you're flooding the body with these weak estrogen-like compounds, what it does, every single cell has an estrogen receptor. And those receptors take up that weak, weak estrogen because you're flooding the body with these weak estrogen-like compounds. And it doesn't allow these stronger estrogens. And we get strong estrogens from our environment. They're called xenoestrogens. We get stronger estrogens from animals if you're eating an animal-based diet. So we're gonna be getting their estrogens. Dairy products contains estrogens. And these are very, very strong potent hormones. You know, nobody's telling you not to, you know, drink milk because of the estrogen problem. They're just telling you to stay away from soy, right? But the thing is, is that the milk actually has more estrogen, more, the stronger estrogens in it that binds these receptors and the longer the, and the longer and the stronger it binds those receptors, what it does, estrogen is a, a proliferator, right? So it, it encourages growth. If there is cancer there, 
then what it's going to do is going to encourage that proliferation or growth of that cancer cell. And that's what we want to prevent. So by flooding the body with these weaker estrogen-like compounds, what it actually does is it protects the body because they bind up those receptors and act as a blockade to those stronger estrogens that are coming in from our environment, even our own estrogens that we're creating in our own bodies. They're stronger. And so it, it actually has a very good effect. I think they close up at 7. Okay, doors. we're going to, I guess, close up at 7. Well, I mean, they're closing the doors. Oh, and what we want to do is we want to allow you guys to go back out there and play again. Yeah. So and we're going to kind of finish up here. Maybe I'll ask one more question. Uh, how many times a week do you eat that big bowl of salad? Or what do you typically put in there? Well, I have my clients eat the salad that size every day. So I mean that yeah this that's see that's the challenge people often wonder you, you mean this I've been to people's houses for dinner and they put a salad bowl in front of me and I thought it was my salad and it was a salad for everybody <laughs> so that's the challenge the salad is the meal so you want large volume you can't gain weight that way it's impossible so when my clients are trying to gain weight I don't have them doing that much salad because they're gonna be so full so a salad like that easily every day and a rainbow salad so lots of different colors you decide what colors as long as it's fruits and vegetables and things like that, okay? So, and then I also encourage them to put maybe two cups of steamed vegetables in there. Um, just so you know, we'll give you our information, so, but we also are gonna be at Ask the Expert booth, that's where our booth is. I have a few DVDs left um, of my cooking videos that we've done, and I don't, I, you have at least your, your cards. Well, I've got business cards, so if anybody's yeah. interested in coming to see me, I'm in Lakewood again, my practice is Livewell Health Center here. And I've been in practice for about 10 years in those locations. So would love to talk to you a little bit further. And yeah, my webpage is just johnpierre.com. So thank you guys so much for coming. Really enjoyed it.